The Music is Life podcast has our own merch now over on tpublic.com. Click the link below in the video description. Looking for some new threads? We got t-shirts, long sleeves, hoodies, crew neck sweatshirts, tank tops, baseball tees, and also clothes for kids and onesies for your little infant metalheads. Don't want clothes but love the Java? We got you covered with coffee mugs and travel mugs. Need protection for your electronics? We've also got phone and laptop cases. We've got everything you're looking for at the tpublic.com Music is Life podcast store. Use my link below for fast service. Thanks for your support. TerraNut is proud to offer you a natural nut bar chock full of healthy fats, minerals, and protein that meet your demands. Go to their website, www.terranut.com. You can order from them directly and they will ship it to you. Use my coupon code LUMAVS and you will get a 25% discount on your first order. TerraNut Superfood Snacks, www.terranut.com. Don't forget to use coupon code LUMAVS at checkout. Fuel your life. We are ready and waiting for you now. If it's a fight that you dare see, we've acquired our strength through pain. No more are we pathetic and we You are the reason why we claim that we've all become this way. And I regret the prison that I created for my Thanks for tuning into the Music is Live podcast. This is your host, Lou Mavs. Find out everything you need to know about the show over at musicislivepodcast.com and pray I beat this sore throat. What's the matter with you? A frog, a frog in my throat. Oh, you've got a frog in your throat. Come on. Say what's the matter with you? Are you crazy or something? <laughs> ah, hot tea. Good stuff. <clears throat> okay, somewhat back to normal. So... On today's episode, I was going to have James Lilquist from Beyond Bushido on board so we could discuss Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. James is currently dealing with some personal issues that I don't want to get into. I want to respect his privacy, but everything is okay. My thoughts are with James. Nothing bad happened, but again, I just don't want to get into it. Our meeting was delayed and is delayed until further notice. So instead, I brought on board a friend of mine from St. John's University, Melissa Scopolitis. And it looks like ladies' night here at the gallery. Who was an intern for the Jim Henson Company. So I thought it'd be cool to have her on an episode of Music is Live podcast so we could discuss her time with the Henson Company, her thoughts on the Muppets, what got her into the Muppets, and also her opinions on Emmett Otter. This is a pretty cool episode. Melissa was awesome and answered every question that I gave her and you know she was wonderful she's welcome back on the show anytime and James again you owe me (laughs) just kidding well am I anyways enjoy part one of the music is live podcast Muppet special just in time for Christmas whoever's watching thank you for watching I hope you have either a Merry Christmas or a Happy Hanukkah or Happy Kwanzaa or a Happy Festivus or a happy Saturday if you don't celebrate. Anyways, enjoy the show. So in today's discussion of Emmett Otter, I wanted to ask a friend of mine who actually worked for the Jim Henson Company as an intern, a fellow graduate from St. John's University, Mrs. Melissa Scopolitis. <laughs> Melissa, how you doing? Thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Lou. I'm happy to be here. A little backstory on how we met. We both met on a Facebook Muppets group that I don't think either of us are a part of anymore. (laughs) It got too political. So I was like, I can't deal with this. And (laughs) I'm not even sure which one it was at this point. I'm on so many different ones. (laughs) I didn't know there were that many. (laughs) As I mentioned, you were an intern at the Jim Henson Company, right? Yes, I was. Cool. First off. Let's discuss your love for the Muppets. How far back do you go with them? I mean, probably like, I guess, like most folks going back to the days of Sesame Street when I was, you know, a little kid. I just loved the show growing up. And, you know, as I got a little bit older, I fell in love with the Muppet Show when it was on weekly. I was born in 77. So the Muppet Show was actually still on in its first run, you know, initially was the later seasons. So I'm, I'm, I have a special love for the later seasons, like seasons four and five, because that's what was actually on airing for the first time when I was a kid. Just 
watching it and the big giant television we had when I was a kid um, in our den in my old house. I was, you know, listening to Sesame Street records on my little record player when I was a kid. You know, just kind of just, uh, you know, it was, it was just one. I just always loved the Muppets. And I was always kind of one of these like nerdy kind of fans from the beginning because I used to love to read. So I would read the backs of all the record sleeves. So I knew the names Jim Henson and Frank Oz. I understood pretty early on that these were people doing the different characters. And I just, you know, just just love them so much. You know, they've played a very integral part, you know, in in my artistic, you know, journey and just in growing up, um, I think as a person, you know, some of the values I've taken from all the specials and, and TV shows over the years. You know, I remember going to see Great Muppet Caper in the movie theater when I was a kid, you know, Fall at Bird. And, you know, as, as the years went on, we always went to go see, you know, whatever the new project was that was out. Um, I remember even my parents taking me to see The Dark Crystal when I was very little, probably freaked me out at the time. Oh yeah, but that was a masterpiece. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I've just just always been a fan i don't i think there might have been like a very very brief period in my early teens pre-teens when i was like i thought it was a little too cool for the muppets and i started i'm i regret now that i threw out a couple of my fisher price dolls that you know are worth you know ridiculous amounts on ebay and things you like throughout your retirement melissa <laughs> that's right that's right but for the most part though i mean i've always been a muppet fan i don't remember not having them as a part of my life in some way, shape, or form. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably have to say the same thing. For me, it was definitely Sesame Street that opened me up to what Muppets were. But when it came time for the Muppets themselves, I mean, obviously Kermit was the gateway between both shows, Muppet Show and Sesame Street. I recall that the Muppet Show, I think its first run may have ended but saturdays at like 7 30 on channel 2 in new york mm -hmm. wcbs they would still play those episodes so yeah. i got to see them and that's probably like my earliest recollection of what the muppets were what made me fall in love with them was muppet babies oh yeah from there it came my love for the Muppet movies, my favorite being The Great Muppet Caper. I still get choked up when I hear Rainbow Connection. I mean, I got to share that with my daughter last year. She was like swaying to it as I was holding her. And Aww. yeah, I got a little choked up. Yeah, Lou Mouse is a softie. Bite me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I never did get to see any of the Muppet, well, Henson films in the theaters. I do remember my first two films in the theater. It was either Ghostbusters or Gremlins. But oh, like... Okay. You know, I, I can't, I I can't say it was in the theater. Yeah, I remember seeing yeah. Gremlins in theater. I can't say it was cheated. I mean, you know, like <laughs> Ghostbusters or Gremlins. I mean, that does not suck. <laughs> the, with the Muppets, though, what I recall growing up, especially is which is why I love them still to this day, is the fact that Jim Henson, there was something about him where there was just there was heart in everything he did, whether it was Sesame Street, whether it was the Muppets, whether it was the films, you know, prime example for me, keep Christmas with you from Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. That's my favorite Christmas song. And I don't like Christmas songs except for that <laughs> one. Just the memories that I carried with me from my youth to today. And now I get to pass it on to my kid. There was heart that Jim Henson had that as much as I still love the Muppets today, I feel like there's something missing. I agree. And, you know, I don't think there's any like one person at fault for that. I think it's a variety of things of why it is. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, it's a different world now, you know, without getting too deep, but, you know, it's a different world now. The goals are different, I think, in what they're trying to do with the Muppets than they were back then. And, you know, and then again, so many of the core people who helped bring these characters to life, including the writers, which is, I don't think the writers get enough credit because, Everybody talks about Jim Henson and Frank Oz, which is great. And yes, of course, they, they embodied the soul of these characters, but they were also going off scripts that these amazing writers. You Don know, Saleem being one of them, if I recall correctly. Don Saleem, Jerry Jewell. There's just so many people that were involved behind the scenes that I don't think get their due overall, who were just such talented. John Stone, who directed Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. Like all these people mm -hmm. who just understood what made them tick that I think is really what's lacking now and as a long time fan it's frustrating because i still want to support them i still love these characters and you know i want to be excited about the next project but i think they're missing what m made people love them so much and i think also the fact that you know back then the muppets were really seen like celebrities where i think now they're almost seen almost like cartoonish and more nostalgia whereas back then you know kermit could go sit on the tonight show with johnny carson and you really believed he was speaking to kermit you know mm -hmm. and now everything is very safe and scripted and, you know, where Jim Henson would just kind of say things ad-libbed off the cuff. And that's what made the performances memorable. 
and you know Miss Piggy was on magazine covers and all these things that you know you just don't see them doing now and I think that's a big chunk of what's missing of what made them so revered you know to the general public yeah you can say the same thing even about like someone like Frank Oz I remember seeing a talk show with him in the 70s where he came on with the Cookie Monster puppet but the moment Cookie Monster's mouth open and his eyes jiggled. It's like you forgot he was there. Mm-hmm. You know, like that transference of character, it made it feel like it was real. There was definitely spe- something special about their original crew. A- and I will say this I loved Steve Whitmire as Kermit. Mm-hmm. And I'm not knocking Matt Vogel. I think he's an excellent puppeteer and obviously very talented. Otherwise, he wouldn't be working on the Muppets and, and mm-hmm. Sesame Street. But I just feel like Steve carried over a little bit of what Jim left. That heart was still there. So mm-hmm. I, I do miss him as part of the crew. I know he's doing stuff on his own right now which is great but hopefully we'll still get more muppet related material in the future and hopefully there'll be a new group of pe- kids out there a new group of people who will look at it with new eyes and not just nostalgia at least that's what i hope because the company that owns the muppets also owns marvel and star wars so please keep them alive do them justice oh, won't somebody please think of the children <laughs> Let's talk about how you ended up interning at the Jim Henson Company. Please, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. So actually, in in an odd kind of way, it goes back to being at St. John's to some degree. I went into St. John's wanting to be an art major. I wanted to get into graphic design. When I had gone initially for my first interview with the art department there, they had a small little postcard with the famous picture with Jim Henson sitting with Kermit in the theater seat that we sitting in front of like the Muppet mural that's all over the internet. Very famous promotional photo of Jim Henson. And uh, in the little brochure that the St. John's art department had given me, was listed a whole bunch of companies that they had done internships with prior and they had experience and connections with the Jim Henson company. I was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. And that's kind of what I wanted to do, but I wasn't sure what capacity I wanted to be with Henson as far as, you know, I had no background in puppeteering. You know, I never thought in a million years to even work for Henson, but I thought, well, that's kind of cool though. Cause I would love to do something with them. I thought maybe doing more illustration or some kind of artwork for them be an interesting way to go from there. When I was starting to, go, you know, apply for internships in my senior year, kind of same kind of thing. You had to just send out applications and and back then it wasn't as easy now because we didn't have the internet resources that we have now. We can just Google something and find out, oh, here's how you can contact the Jim Henson company. You had to kind of go through different channels. At the time, speaking of Steve Whitmire, I had been friendly with him since I was 13 years old. We were email friends from very early on, like the early nineties. No kidding. Yeah. So we, we became friends Kind of almost the same way we met um, on a Muppet. It was a message board at the time. It wasn't, you know, a chat room or a Facebook. It was a message board on the old Prodigy Internet service when I was 13 years old. And there was a Muppet wow, that's fan. that's a throwback. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There was a, there was a Muppet uh, message board. And um, Steve was on there. Dave Goals was on there briefly. Um, Jerry Jewell, the late Jerry Jewell, um, was also on there. And a couple other people you know, behind the scenes, Henson people. And I just became friends with Steve. You know, we chatted. He had already been amazing by inviting me to the set him up at Treasure Island when I graduated high school. And I remember. Was that filmed in New York? No, that was in um, uh, uh, England, in Shepperton. Shepperton Studios in England. So you flew to England to help out with that? No, I didn't. I didn't work on it. Um, I had oh. just graduated high school. I happened to be traveling to England as part of my graduation gift. I was traveling to England with my dad. We went to London for a little vacation. And Steve had said, well, you know, while you guys are in town, you know, come on by. And he arranged a visit for us to the set. That is so cool. Which was amazing. And, you know, we spent the day with him and, you know, just got to hang out and met Tim Curry and who's my favorite actor of all time. So that was a thrill. The only man who could play a transvestite and the devil and a funny butler and pull all three off. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it was, it was just a thrill for me to, so, you know, meeting Tim Curry and Kermit the Frog in the same day, it just didn't get better for me at that point at 17 years old as a high school <laughs> graduate. But You know, at the time, you know, I had kind of told Steve about, you know, my goal of going into college and wanting to do this internship with Henson. And and he said, well, when the time comes, you know, let me know. And he wrote a letter of recommendation. Now, I just want to make clear, he did not get me the internship. I sold myself when I went in there for an interview and all that. 
I'm sure the recommendation helped, but he didn't pull strings to to lack. You got in on your own merit. He basically vouched for you, but it was all you. I totally get it. Exactly. So, you know, and it and it was great. I originally gone for applied for a graphic position at the Henson offices in Manhattan, and they already filled the position. So I remember one of like the recruiters calling me and saying, well, we do, and this was after I had interviewed with them and everything. And they said, well, we don't have anything in the graphics department, but we have an opening in the Muppet Workshop. That was a no-brainer. Jackpot. <laughs> exactly. So I said, okay, well, it has nothing to do with my major. I don't care. Whatever you want me to do, you know, I'll go do it. Because how many internships do you actually get to work hands-on with whatever the production company is or whatever the company is that producing that you actually work on, you know, it wasn't just getting coffee for people. It was working hands-on with the Muppets. They had an in-house database of characters for their own reference. They were looking up something for production. Everything was very detailed. For example, you know, they, they had an extra, you know, frog that was maybe used as a background character on the Muppet show or something that wasn't Kermit. We had to take a picture of that frog, put the details in, you know, what color is he? What size is he? What was he used on before? And it was basically just building this whole database of characters and props and some costume pieces and things like that. So I had to photograph all these things for this in-house database. And at the time it was really funny because you know, it was, we were using like a one megapixel digital camera at the time. I had no background in photography, which I think is also a kind of help. I mean, I did photography a little bit at St. John's. I was in the Spectator Humor Magazine. I remember the Spectator. I think yeah. Howie Pearl was the editor at yeah. one point. Yeah, my, my, my friend Howie, yes. You know Howie? I know Howie very well, yes. How's he doing? He's good. <laughs> He's very good. Please give him my best. He's living down in Florida now. He actually lives near my mother-in-law, which is kind of funny. Kind of small. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, he's he's doing very well. Yeah, I talked to him pretty regularly. His birthday was recently. You know, we messaged each other here and there. He was always a very funny guy. He was always very nice to me. So, uh, you know, I always yeah, appreciated he's, he's, that. Hey, Howie, hope you're watching this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's I got my own good. podcast. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, he's, a, he's a good guy. Very but, cool. Um, so were you College of Professional Studies? No, I was in St. John's College. I, I was going for a BFA, Bachelor of Fine Arts. Oh, St. John's College. Okay. Yeah, so most of my classes were in St. John's Hall. Yeah, a couple, in, I think, in Sullivan Hall at the time. But being on Spectator, I had a little bit of photography experience. But going back to Henson, I really didn't have any other, you know, photography experience. So I trained my eye for photography, and because I do dabble in it a little bit now on the side, so I think that kind of helped in that regard. So while it wasn't for graphic design, I think it helped develop another art of you know avenue that I didn't think I was going to be doing anything with, and it's kind of proved pretty good in you know, the past several years, especially. And it was a great experience. I mean, again, it was only a brief short month, you know, a few spring semester from January to like April of 99 that I was there. And it was like me and one other intern, but it was really cool. I had the opportunity to build props for the TV show Bear in the Big Blue House for their Halloween episode. And I got to visit the set of Sesame Street. I, I got to do a lot of different things while I was there that, you know, I wouldn't have gotten to do, I think, in, in other aspects. And again, so it wasn't a typical internship. Maybe it didn't necessarily help prepare me for, you know, what I'm doing now and in life, but it, you know, as a fan, it was a dream come true. And I, I don't regret, you know, at all. And it's just, just to have that opportunity. So I worked with my dream company, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to say that, you know, even though it was a brief time. I think that's a wonderful story. And that's a great memory that you just shared with everybody. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you. So you mentioned your friendship with Steve Whitmire. Does that still continue to this day? It does. Yeah, we've actually, it's funny because we don't talk regularly. I do follow his video. I'll plug him. He has a wonderful YouTube thing that he does. It's called Caven, where he does this character that he's built. And, you know, it's called um, Weldon the IT Troll. Yes, I've seen that. That was pretty funny. And, you know, obviously Steve's a great, you know, puppeteer. He built the puppet, you know, he, and he's got, you know, a a production studio wherever he does that near his home. He has a nice crew behind the scenes that he works with. I think his wife is involved and, you know, he does these great production pieces. The gist of it is he takes um, live phone calls. He does it live. He does about once a month. He should have one coming up, if not this Friday, next Friday. He usually does it like the second or last Friday each month. And he takes live calls through and he uses the um, Discord app to do that, which is sometimes a little wonky, but it's, you know, it's effective. And it's great because he can reach everybody. I mean, he has callers from Europe, from Spain. He's got calls from all over the world, which is really interesting. And, you know, he just shares, they share stories and he does, and he kind of interspurts it with little production pieces. Sometimes he has guests on, um, He's had like Lou Ferrigno on. He has like these, you know, celebrity guests on, on occasionally that are fun and they interact with Weldon. They do little skits and things. And it's, it's, it's a really fun interactive show. It has a lot of like that kind of Muppet zaniness. You could definitely feel the influence there. Again, a uh, carryover of the heart of Jim Henson. So yeah. 
I can see why you would have that. I'll definitely post the link in the uh, description below so that people could directly see it, subscribe to it. Yeah, anything to support Steve Whitmire because I just, you know, I don't use this word often, but I, I think he's a genius. So yeah, yeah, he is. He's he's very talented. I mean, he's musically he's very talented. He's he's a very spiritual guy. He's he's a very interesting guy to talk to. He's a lot of amazing stories, a lot of amazing experiences, even outside of performing and puppetry. He's just. You know, he does a lot of amazing things, you know, with his with his time. And you know, I know he volunteers um, with uh, a wild uh, life preserve out in California, Tippy Hedron's preserve, um, Shambhala, it's called. I know he's on the board there with his wife. You know, so they've tended to he does production pieces for them. And he's, he's, he's involved in a lot of amazing things. And um, he's just a great guy. And the last time I saw him was actually 2018 at a convention in Philly. We don't see each other very often. But we keep in touch. And it's great to talk to him off and out because back in the day when I first started communicating with him, it was very hard because of his schedule with the Muppets and he just wasn't the computer guy. And now, you know, because of today's technology and you have to promote yourself, he's always on social media. So now it's easier to get in touch with him now than it was back then. So, you know, we don't call each other up on the phone per se, but like, you know, I'll shoot a message on Instagram. He'll respond like within a day or so, like we'll chit chat back and forth. When I saw him again, 2018, you know, we were just, my husband met him for the first time and Steve was just saying, he was in awe of like how long we've been talking to each other. He goes, we've known each other for like 30 years, technically. And it's true. Yeah, you knew and, since you were a kid. So, yeah. So, you know, and I think, you know, that He's almost kind of got like that, like that proud papa kind of, you know, vibe with me. You know, he came out, gave me a big hug. You know, he, he's just he's just a good guy. Like, I really don't think there's a bad bone in his body. Mr. Whitmire, if you ever want to be on my podcast, please consider this an open invitation. I'd love to have you. <laughs> oh, there's your cat, Mozart. He's so <laughs> yeah. cute. At the time that you were interning there, did you get to meet Frank Oz? I've met Dave Goals. The first time I met Dave Goals was actually during my internship. I've met him several times since. He had come in for a day. They were filming at the time. It was, I think it was the Hallmark. It wasn't the Hallmark channel yet. It was a channel called Odyssey that was owned by Hallmark. That I think now it has become what the Hallmark channel is on cable. But mm -hmm. at the time it was called the Odyssey channel. It was like a family you know, oriented channel. I, they were showing some Muppet stuff back in the day. And they were filming these little interstitials like in between commercials with the different Muppet characters. I forget what they were, what they called them. It would be like Gonzo. It's like, you know, um, Gonzo, you know, discusses, you know, cooking or whatever. There's some kind of topic involved. <laughs> and they were, it was just a quick little skit. And it was kind of like uh, Muppetisms. That's what they were called. They were called Muppetisms. And it basically had like a little phrase, but it would show like the characters doing something in relation to that phrase and kind of illustrating it physically or visually. And Dave Goals was in town to film one of those. Um, Steve had come into town for one of those. Frank Oz had come into town one of those, but he came in on the day that I was not assigned to work. Bummer. <laughs> so I only was working at um, three days a week uh, during my senior semester at Henson. So that's all I was doing that semester for, for school. Credit was the internship. I forget how many hours it is for the what it was at the time. It was three days a week. So, of course, he was there on the Tuesday and Thursday, and I was there Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And they said to me, well, you can come in, but, you know, we're not going to have anything for you to do. And at the time, because I really wanted to be hired there, I was like, all right, I'm going to back off and not be the fangirl today and just – not be in anybody's way and not come in that day, you know? So I just let it be. And I regret it now because I could have had the opportunity to watch Frank Oz actually work in person. I have met him a couple of times since I've had very nice interactions with him on Twitter. You know, he's, he's again, he's, he's an amazing guy too. Very intense, very interesting guy. That's probably the only thing I regret with the internship was not going in the day that he was there to perform. Cause I really would have loved to have witnessed that in person. But, you know, it is what it is, you know. I hear you. He's had such a great career as a director. He did direct a film that I thought was hilarious. I think it was Death at a Funeral. And oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. That was a good one. Yes. But don't feel so bad about not getting to meet Frank Oz because I blew my opportunity as well. I was working at the ASCAP building in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, my first full-time job out of college. And it was across the street from Lincoln Center. Mm. And in the same building, ASCAP was on the third floor. On the second floor was Sesame Workshop. Yep. And I thought to myself, should I? Shouldn't I? What could I do? I'm not a puppeteer. And I mean, I'm a, music I'm a musician, but reading music is not in my forte. And, you know, at the time I was like, I don't write the kind of songs that would be good for Sesame Street, I write metal and hardcore songs. You can't have, I mean, you can have them up. It's going, rah, 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 but you, you know, like that, that's who could have sung my songs, the two headed monster. 
but I digress. <laughs> I'd have to say, though, two things. Number one, Jim Henson and Frank Oz, as good as any classic comedy team from oh, the old era. And I'd have to say, though, my single favorite Muppet performer would have to be, and God rest his soul, I'll always love him, Mr. Jerry Nelson. Oh, yeah. The voice of Emmett Otter. So now we have a good segue into our discussion of Emmett Otter's Jug Band Christmas. This was originally a Canadian production that was broadcasted in 1977. And then I believe it premiered on HBO the following year in 1978. And then every year after that, it was on broadcast television. But I think it was on Nickelodeon annually in the 90s. Yeah, it was on Nickelodeon. I think it showed up on the Disney Channel at one point. I think also that Hallmark Channel, the Odyssey Channel we were talking about. Yeah, they've popped up in a few different like networks over the years. Yeah. And on top of that, though, there's different variations of it. Some have Kermit, some don't. Mm -hmm. The incarnation that was made for broadcast television has his narration, but that's the only one that does. The one that's available right now has Kermit in it, but no narration. But there are special features on the Blu-ray edition where they have outtakes and I think some things that they omitted from the final product. I actually saw the outtakes. Somebody posted them on youtube i thought they were hilarious they're very funny. yeah they're on the regular dvd as well because that's what i have i don't have the blu-ray but i have the dvd it was like an anniversary dvd out a number mm-hmm. of years ago and that's yeah yeah i didn't realize frank oz was supposed to be the voice of mama otter i thought that was uh yeah. pretty funny when i heard that i'm like oh, I-, I can't help but laugh every time i hear frank oz do a female's voice <laughs> oh my goodness he does it so perfectly well but you know hey he did my favorite sesame street muppet grover so you know. <laughs> when did you first see Emmett Otter's Chug Band Christmas? Oh, wow. The first time I saw it. It's For me, be- it was two years ago, the first time ever. I kid you not. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. I'm a newcomer to the game, but man, do I love it. I, I don't know if I saw it initially when it was originally aired. I don't think I did. I think I did see it possibly in the early 90s, late 80s when it was on one of these cable channels at the time. Because you know, there was a period... I was just recording stuff constantly off of television. Uh, that anything Muppet related. Nickelodeon used to do these like Muppet matinees on like Saturdays or Sunday afternoons. And I used to record hours of like the Muppet show and all these different specials. And I think Emmett Otter was one of those. Because I know I have a very old copy that I burned to DVD from an old VHS tape. And I know it was a broadcast of Emmett Otter on one of those channels. I remember seeing it like an advertisement for one of the Disney channels. So it must have been somewhere around there, like early 90s, I want to say. It was probably the first time I saw it. Yeah, I remember the Muppet matinees. They, they would actually air them on the weekdays, too, because I remember being home from school in the summertime and it would be Muppet Show, then Muppet Babies. Mm-hmm. Now you can't find the original Muppet Babies anywhere because it would probably cost them boatloads in copyright fees because of so much. Jim Henson got away with so much stuff and yeah. they just said, yeah, no, we'll let you, Jim. Go ahead. And mm-hmm. it's like, now it's like, no, 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 you got to pay up. So yeah. that was the magic of Jim Henson. He could do no wrong. He was also a very shrewd businessman from what I hear. He had an amazing way with people, obviously. So I think that worked to his advantage. But I think also when it came down to it, he knew how to get things done. And, you know, obviously, I mean, he built this empire of a company, you know. But I mean, knowing people have worked for him for years, I mean, they said he was very direct about when he wanted to get things accomplished, you know, business-wise and made deals that, you know, he knew exactly what he was doing. Yeah, I never heard anyone say a bad thing about him. They actually, posted the footage from his funeral Mm -hmm. on YouTube and I remember watching it. Frank Oz had such a beautiful tribute to him. I mean, everybody did. Especially when all the Muppeteers got up and sang the song When the River Meets the Sea from Emmett Otter at his funeral. I mean, you can't help but get choked up and see that these guys had genuine love for him. Yeah, But, you know, you have to be a shrewd businessman. I mean, let's not forget that Back in the day in 75, when SNL, Saturday Night Live, first premiered, there was a sketch that Lorne Michaels wanted to dedicate for Jim Henson. The, the Land of Gorch, I think. That's it, it. That's it. I remember reading that yeah. some of the writers said, we don't write for felt. <laughs> and I think the terminology used by Mr. John Belushi was mucking fuppets was the exact <laughs> word. <laughs> But then he had his show called The Muppet Show. And even though it only lasted five seasons, it is on Disney+. Plus. I have the first three seasons on DVD. And mm-hmm. it's funnier than anything SNL has done in the last 20 years. <laughs> Except for anything with Bill Hader. He's great. But that's it. <laughs> he is good, Bill Hader. <laughs> oh, my God. He was great. It's like, it's, 
It's like a living Muppet, that man. I mean, come <laughs> on, he's great. Actually, that was my nickname in college, too. I was in the Chapel Players group. Oh, and okay. funny story, before we continue on Emmett Otter, I was a sound engineer for a couple of their musicals. So I'm up in the booth and there's no working microphone for anyone to hear me. So I had to scream out the window so I could get people's attention. And my buddy, Jason Crawford, who was also in the Chapel Players group, he yelled out, Hey, are you Statler or Waldorf? (laughs) (laughs) Hence, I earned the nickname Muppet. Anyway. It's interesting you mentioned the Chapel Players because when I was doing my internship at Henson, I was actually asked that semester by one of my fellow um, art majors. She was was part of the Chapel Players. They were doing the production of uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Wow, no kidding. Knowing that I was into the Muppets and and puppetry and everything, and she said, you know, would you want to puppeteer, you know, the plant of Audrey too in this production? I said, I'd love to, but I'm starting my internship with the Jim Henson Company, and I there's no way I was going to be around for rehearsals and you know all the stuff involved with getting the the play off the ground. So I said, unfortunately, I got to turn it down. But now I'm thinking about like that might have been an amazing experience too, you know? Yeah, Chapel Players was great. We did Bye Bye Birdie, and Mm -hmm. then we did the Christmas concert for charity where we raised money for St. John's Food Drive. And then the third thing that I did, which allowed me to get into Alpha Psi Omega, which is the theater honor society. It's not a fraternity. It's an honor society was an improvised adaptation of Oedipus Rex. Oh, wow. How they got away with that at St. John's, I'll never know. I was just a sound guy. (laughs) But anyway, moving right along. So Emmett Hodder, probably the first time I think anyone in Henson worked with puppet strings. I don't think they ever used puppet strings before in that vicinity, meaning that you could tell, you know, with certain wide shots to see Emmett and his friends and his mom walking or running or moving, there would actually be people above it, not Mm -hmm. under it to control the puppets. Would you agree to that? They may have done it here and there before, but I think Emmett Otter was probably one of the first productions where it was a good portion of marionette technique and radio control too. I unfortunately never got to meet him. This brilliant effects mechanical engineer, his name was Faz Fazakis, which is actually where they got Fozzie's name from. He kind of rigged up all these different special effects, like, you know, how the otters row a boat and, you know, the birds flying over the pond and all these different things you see in the special it was a very different set than I think they were used to working on. It was very detailed. Production-wise, it's a beautiful special. Even just the lighting, like with the sunrise and the sunset over the, the, the pond and the snow and, and the way they did the little houses with the village. And you, you believe that this place exists somewhere, which is part of the magic of what Jim was so brilliant at, creating these worlds. I think they made the stage where they did everything, I think it was 55 feet long if i recall correctly it's insane how detailed everything is from the way the houses were built the way that the river flowed again there was magic there it definitely shined through if i recall correctly though this was the first time paul williams and jim henson ever had a working relationship i believe so i believe that was their first collaboration yes I mean, the songs that he wrote for Emmett Otter, I mean, to this day, (laughs) my daughter always sings Brothers, you know. I love that song. (laughs) Yeah, they look adorable singing it. But, you know, I think they should have sang Barbecue, regardless. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the the river bottom gang probably one of the funniest group of villains that i ever saw but were they even villains or were they just like you know punks i guess what would you say yeah, they were kind of like the town bullies the town you know <laughs> renegades for lack of a better word you know they were just kind of this unruly kind of little group that just kind of wrecked havoc wherever they went they were obnoxious they were very noisy <laughs> yeah they were punks such great musicians I mean, (laughs) the Nightmare song. There's so much about it that reminds me of Parliament Funkadelic meets Alice Cooper. I loved it. To this day, that's actually a song that I'll add on my classic rock playlist. (laughs) That's the genius of Paul Williams as a writer. I mean, he can do all kinds of different styles of music. You know, he can write these beautiful ballads like the Rainbow Connection, and he can do stuff like the Riverbottom Nightmare Band song. He's just very talented that way. I mean, I'm a fan of his music and of his generically non-Muppet related. I I love Paul Williams. Talk about genius. And he's written for everybody who's anybody in the music industry. And he was the president of ASCAP for a while and he's still working now. He was involved with Daft Punk. Like he's, you know, the guy doesn't stop. I did not meet him when I worked at ASCAP. I wish I did. I met him briefly back in 2013, I think it was. Carnegie Hall was doing a musical world to Jim Henson tribute. And Paul was actually there in person. There was two shows that day. I got to meet him in between the two performances and he came out, you know, the stage door and he just 
got a quick picture with him, said hello, you know, I love your work, basically. And he was, he was very nice, very approachable, really, really interesting guy. And the documentary they did about him a few years back, Paul Williams is Still Alive, is an excellent Highly recommended documentary about his career in general and just some of the battles he had to deal with, you know, with some of his addiction issues and things like that throughout the 70s. And he's he's amazing, you know. Yeah, he never gets any credit for his acting. He was in one of the Planet of the Apes films. Yeah, he's actually a really good actor, too. Yeah, he's been in a bunch of stuff that, you know, he was a guest up on, on The Odd Couple. Like, he's done so many different things, acting-wise, music-wise. He's done a little bit of everything. What was it about Emmett Otter that you loved the most about it? I think I've the two things that stand out to me is I really like the design of the characters. And I know Emmett Otter was originally a children's book that was not Muppet created or Henson created, but they, the builders, you know, built these puppets based on these illustrations from this children's book that they were just beautiful looking characters. I mean, you know, the, it was a uh, Wendell, the porcupine, he looks like a porcupine, you know, like just the, the, the physical design of these characters I think was one of the things that I really liked about as a kid. And then, and the music. I would say those things too. I mean, I never read the book of Emmett Otter when I was a kid. That wasn't something that we had. I, I don't even remember it seeing it in my grade school library. The privilege of, of, of having a child and being able to watch this with her because, you know, again, I only came across it because it ended up being on Amazon Prime one time. I needed a break from watching Sesame Street because it was the same five seasons that were available on yeah. Prime. And I said, okay, she likes Muppets. Let me see if there's something else for her. And it was there. And I watched it with her. We both fell in love with it. And from there, we were able to find Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. And so many memories of my youth came back because I think they stopped showing it on PBS in 1988. Mm, that sounds about right. Yeah. But the cool thing is that in Astoria, Queens, at the Museum of the Moving Image, there is an actual exhibit dedicated to Jim Henson still there. Everything yes. from Sam and Friends up until the point where Henson sold everything to the company that we won't mention. You know who it <laughs> is. Uh, <laughs> they also have showings of some of the older Muppet material, including mm -hmm. Emmett Otter and Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. Did you get to see any of that before the pandemic? I actually was one of the donors for that exhibit. It's a permanent exhibit at the Museum of the Moving Image. They had done a Kickstarter campaign back when they were um, still trying to get everything, you know, completed with it to get it opened. And I was one of the donors. So I actually got to attend the opening night ceremony, so to speak, for all the donors, all the Kickstarter donors, which was really great because we were like the first people to see it before it opened to the public. They had a giveaway uh, rewards for, you know, donating for like whatever level you donate, you got a different award. I got like a t-shirt and they had the collectors um they were these special edition um chocolate bars based on the characters of fraggle rocks they had each one had different had different fraggle on the wrapper the exhibit's amazing um i actually have friends who helped who actually have pieces in the exhibit and who helped install the exhibit and uh, i have also friends who have some of their stuff on display there that they owned one of my friends austin he has some hand puppets that are made of some of the old uh, i think of uh, uh, wilkins and wonkins from the old coffee commercials um, there were these hand puppets that if you collected like things off the coffee cans, you sent away and you got these little hand puppets in the mail. And Austin had them. He found them on eBay or whatever it was. And his puppets are in the exhibit. Yeah, I've attended many of the screenings there over the years. I'm not a museum member because I'm just because I'm not close enough to, you know, really take advantage of the membership. But I've attended many Muppet related events at the museum over this past several years. The Jim Henson Legacy runs it and they do an amazing job. Um, the gentleman who runs it, Craig Shaman, is a longtime writer for the Muppets. He's a friend of mine, also a former Henson intern. He does amazing work in, you know, keeping all these programs going over there. I think they just had one for the new Fraggle Rock series and the anniversary of Fraggle Rock, where they had some of the, the, the behind the scenes folks from the original series and some of the new, you know, showing old, you know, clips. I know they did it recently, um, a Halloween thing. You know, they, uh, unfortunately, I haven't been there in a while. Uh, last time I was there was, actually it was 2019, I think, right before the pandemic for my birthday. Um, I had gone with my sister because she hadn't been to the exhibit yet. And, you know, she was thrilled seeing, you know, Cookie Monster in person. She loves Kuzbanian babies from the Muppet show. So she was really excited to see all those things up close, you know, and actually in, in the felt, so to speak. So <laughs> I've seen some of the uh, Wilkins and Wonkins uh, commercials on YouTube. I think they're hilarious. They even have the Wheels, Foots and Crowns commercials where you saw the original incarnation of Cookie Monster with teeth. Mm -hmm in it yes obviously doesn't have cookie monster's voice seeing that was insane and you really begin to appreciate the fact that henson was 
you know, admittedly was a fan of Howdy Doody. He was the go to guy for a lot of these companies, comparable to almost George A. Romero, the director of mm-hmm. Night of the Living Dead. I mean, he started a film production company to make commercials for local businesses in his area in Pittsburgh. You know, it's great that people saw Henson saying, hey, look, we want to promote this product. Can you create a commercial for it? And that's how he got his start. And, you know, that and Sam and Friends, of course, you know, to see that it evolved into what it did with the children's television workshop, which is now Sesame Workshop, to see the evolution of those characters. I mean, to this day, one of the funniest things that I've ever seen Jim Henson and Frank Oz do, I think it was on the Ed Sullivan show, and it was Kermit singing, What Kind of Fool Am I? And Grover's interrupting him. Oh, yeah. You could see comedy genius right there. I don't think two normal people could do, you know, but right. through the through through the world of the Muppets, it worked. And and yes, I call Grover a Muppet. I don't care what anyone says. <laughs> Grover, Grover is a Muppet. They're all Muppets. I mean, I, I think that's the big thing. You know, it's funny. I see that discussion a lot online. I, somebody posted that something like that the other day. They're like, oh, you know, it's I think they're talking about Oscar the Grouch or something, even though he's not really a Muppet. I says. Yes, he is. I said on Sesame Street in the credits, it says Jim Henson's Muppets. To this day, it still says Jim Henson's Muppets. It does. But since the company that we can't name is the owner of the Muppet name, does Sesame Workshop have to pay a license, I guess, to use that? I don't know how that works, honestly. I don't know. I don't want to say anything that would be misleading because I don't know what the ins and outs of the, the legalities of that is. But I mean, I do know that they still have the name and mostly, you know, the that company owns the main Muppet characters, you know, the Kermit, Miss Piggy. That's where I think a lot of the confusion comes in there. They think, because people have always said, well, how come this isn't on uh, Plus? You know, how come this isn't on, you know, because it's not owned by them. It's still right. owned by Henson or Sesame or whoever it is, you know, as the rights to it. I think the initial deal that Jim made with them was, I'll give you the Muppets, but Sesame Street Muppets are off limits. Yeah, I recall that. And I think that up until the point he passed away and even after that was always the bone of contention. It's a shame that a great film like Muppet Christmas Carol suffers because there was one scene that they removed. This is not on Brian Henson's fault, the company that we're talking about. They removed the scene where Ebenezer Scrooge, played by Michael Caine, is being sung to the song uh, When Love Is Gone. Mm -hmm. And the reason why apparently that was removed is because Michael Eisner, I believe, if I recall correctly, it was him. He says, oh, kids don't want to see that. And I'm like, but you're taking away context, Mm -hmm. you know, from it. And when they reprise it at the end and they're saying when love is found, it's like, well, when was it gone? (laughs) You know, it's like, I don't know. To me, it just didn't make any sense when they did that. And. You know, when the Muppets were reverted to Sony for Muppets from Space, I thought that was a very funny film, different from the other Muppet films, obviously, but still great in its own right. Unfortunately, as much as we feel like we own the characters, like meaning, you know, fans like you and I, because we grew up with them and we love them this much. The truth is, business wise, we don't. Mm -hmm. We own the memories and we hope they will just continue to do right by them. But, you know, dirty world (laughs) with me, with with Emmett Otter. I mean, I just feel like, you know, you mentioned the music and I I would also have to say that the casting was right for it. Jerry Nelson captured the essence of Emmett Otter perfectly. Oh, absolutely. Jerry Nelson. I I can't say enough nice things about him. He was just a multi- talented force of energy i think people don't understand like you know any you know yes anybody could do a voice or come up with you know the count sure we could all do like a vampire you know dracula kind of voice but jerry was an amazing actor and his background was from acting when i had met him shortly before he had passed on at that carnegie hall event i had a really nice chat with him prior to the show and he was saying how he you know he started kind of doing like summer stock theater like on long island and you know, around Connecticut. And that's where his background is. And, you know, and, and just you know, the, the puppetry came into play later. And he just channeled that talent of acting through the puppets. And that's why he was so amazing at different accents and, you know, different, and, and his music is phenomenal too. I mean, he, 
did this gorgeous album called Churro Daydreams several years back that was brilliant and had some Henson folks on there singing and stuff with him. And some of the musicians were session musicians that had done music for Sesame Street and whatnot. It's amazing. The whole album is just captures like who Jerry was and even you know right down to the cover art that he painted himself. Like he just was a multi-talented creative genius and a really kind man. And I'm sorry I didn't get to know him sooner. When I had met him in 2013, it was unfortunately close to the end of his life. But in that short time, we became pretty friendly on, on Facebook, writing back and forth. And so much so that he mentioned me in the outtakes of Frank Oz's documentary, Muppet Guys Talking. And I his, love that documentary. Yeah, if you if you got the uh, the bonus material that they offered, there is a section where he talks about you know, Muppet fans and everything. And he actually mentions me by name. With, and it's just, it floors me still. And a friend of mine pointed out that he was, he goes, he's Melissa, is he talking about you? And I and it had to be because it was filmed the day after the Carnegie Hall show. And he says, I met Melissa and her friend at the stage door. And he mentioned exactly what I had said to him. And I said, oh my God, you know, this is somebody I grew up, you know, admiring. And who it's a small chat, you know, kind of, he remembered into the next day. And he always told me several times, after that, how nice it was chatting that day. That is such a beautiful story. Yeah, it's it's it blows my mind that you know we had that kind of like little moment. And I used to keep I had I had kept one of his last Facebook messages to me as like inspiration at my uh, one of my former jobs when things were getting rough towards the end of that my time there. And it was just he just said like you know thank you Melissa that that day was. Um, that was a great day. And um, our chat was one of the elements that made it perfect. And he just like, even like eloquently like worded things. <laughs> amazing. You know, I said, that's one of the nicest things anyone ever said to me, period. It was just amazing. You know, well, he struck me as an, as an amazing guy and such a wit and humor about him when they were talking about probably one of my, this would probably have to go down as my favorite Jerry Nelson based sketch. And it was the Rapunzel one from the, <laughs> Sesame Street newsflash where he, he gives uh, Rapunzel this like nasally Brooklyn accent yeah. and Frank Oz is Prince Charming being as obnoxious as ever. All the love and credit in the world to the five guys, Jim, Jerry, Frank and Dave Goals and Richard Hunt. But my goodness, you put the three of them together, Jim, Frank and Jerry, and it was just just I'm I'm thinking about it. That sketch is so ingrained in my DNA. It's like I can't even stop thinking yeah. about it. No, you know which a, one I'm talking about, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they that they pull that one out a lot for a lot of the um like the anniversaries and and like you know best of Sesame Street thing. That one always comes about because it's so uh, so brilliant. You know their 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 camaraderie is just unmatched. You know, and again, I think that's one of the biggest things missing now is just you know. That they, I'm not saying the guys aren't close behind the scenes and whatnot, but it, there's just something, even if it was scripted, it seemed spontaneous back then. However, you know, for whatever reason, whether it was the way, because of the brilliance of their acting or just the, you know, I don't know, but maybe they had more freedom to do stuff in the studio than they do now. I don't know what it is, but even the scripted stuff seemed very like off the cuff. And that's to me what made it great. Like, you know, just, just even the, the jokes and like the one-liners and, you know, some of the sight gags and just all the things that go into it, I think is what, you know, made them up. It's as funny as it was and what ap appealed to all ages too, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that's the other thing where I think now, the, you know, the Muppets, you know, unfor unfortunately seem more, again, like more of a nostalgia. Oh, this is something I liked when I was a kid. It was for kids, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, but back then again, you know, the Muppets, adults love them just as much, you know. I still love them to this day. Yeah. And, you know, I, it makes me happy that my, my my daughter, you know, through Sesame Street and through, you know, what I've shown, you know, what I've shown her up until now, you know, Emmett Otter, the Christmas toy, you know, she loves it just as much as well. So, you know, I'm forever grateful that I, I have that to share with her. Getting back to the uh, Rapunzel sketch, what, what I loved about it was that I think they admitted in the in the mother guys talking documentary, they're like, well, we're supposed to create stuff that's educational for kids. And Frank Oz was like, who cares? It's funny. Keep, keep going. <laughs> Let's just do it. And, you know, I'm so glad that little things like that uh, slip through. And, and of course, Frank Oz and Jerry Nelson were a great team too, especially when they did Grover and fat blue, Mr. Johnson. Oh yeah. I actually made a playlist of a lot of those sketches before YouTube, uh, 
forbade you from making playlists of what they would call kids material. So, you know, even when you minimize it, you can't even watch, you know, you can't even listen to it. So I, I, I don't get a YouTube, but Hey, thanks for, you know, being the platform for my uh, podcast. And I guess <laughs> Emma and Otter definitely hands down one of the best Christmas specials that I ever saw. You know, I feel bad that I only discovered it a couple of years ago, but now it's a constant in our home around the Thanksgiving Christmas holidays. The next and final question is, what are your three favorite Muppet related Christmas specials? And I'll also allow you to include honorable mention. The top two would be, and I don't, I probably just put it first because I was introduced to it first. My top one would be Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. Next, second would be Muppet Family Christmas. Third, probably the Christmas toy. Mm-hmm. Honorable mention? That's tough. I'm surprised you didn't say Emmett Otter. <laughs> you know, I love Emmett Otter, but Emmett Otter was never a favorite because I think, again, like you, I, I saw it later in life. It wasn't ingrained in me as a, as a kid. So I think that's a big part of it. Understood. Not to, t- not to take anything away from it because I love it now. And I you know, I have the, the the vinyl they put out uh, in 2000, 2018, I think it was, for Record Store Day. It was a picture disc. I mean, I, I love it now. God, not to mention. I'm sticking with TV specials? It could be anything. It could be film. It could be an episode of Muppet Show or Muppet Babies. It doesn't matter. Well, then I guess for honorable mention, I would, I would, I would have to say Muppet Christmas Carol. Okay. I'd have to say for me, Three favorites, even though I only watched it a couple of years ago, but I'd, I'd have to give it to Emmett Otter, number three. Number two, I'd have to say Muppet Family Christmas. And number one, I'd have to give it to Christmas Eve on Sesame Street. And my honorable mention, I would say The Christmas Toy. And I was actually introduced to that by my wife. Okay. I didn't even know of The Christmas Toy until she showed it to me on an old VHS tape of hers. And yeah. yes, it had the McDonald's commercials and, yep. you know, all that stuff. <laughs> yeah, they were trying to sell stuff to kids back in the day. Now, were they? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so many great memories because of the Muppets. And, you know, to this day, probably the greatest thing from my childhood that I still carry with me to this day Um Probably more than the Looney Tunes. That would have to be number two. <laughs> yeah, I love the Looney Tunes as well. I mean, classic, classic Warner Brothers. I, I love, I love Looney Tunes. Anything else you want to mention in regards to your time at Henson? I mean, I, I know career wise, you've gone a different path than what you interned at, but it sounds like it was a very memorable special time for you yeah it really was and the the neat thing is too is that at the time as part of my internship i was required by st john's art department to keep a uh, a journal um of what i was doing each day and then every once in a while like we'd meet with the professors and we would go over what the internship was and um at st john's if they felt that you weren't doing what you kind of wanted to do or if they felt like you know you're being taken advantage of as an intern they would get you out of there and I saw them do that with a couple of the students when I was there you know because I remember one student was like oh you know I'm kind of just sitting there reading a book you know unless they ask me to do something and they're like get her out of there we gotta find her someplace else um, thankfully that wasn't my case I was always very busy there but it was nice to have this journal because I have written down what date I was doing what and what I was working on who I met you know and again, you know, it had nothing to do with my my aspirations to go into graphic design, but I think in 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 the long run, it, I, I guess it kind of did benefit me as far as the photography goes because now I kind of do some photography on the side. Um, again, my husband plays um, adaptive sports, so I I do social media and photography for his sports teams. You know, I've done it. I used to volunteer for a dog rescue. I did um, some photography for them. Some of my photos were used for um, the town of Hempstead's uh, calendar. Um, You know, I've had things, opportunities for the photo. And I think that goes back to going back to Henson because again, I'd never had, I never, I took one photography class when I was at St. John's. I never really did photography otherwise. And again, shooting for spectator when they needed stuff, I would go around campus and take pictures of goofy things that we were doing for the photo shoots for the magazine. But as far as like, you know, learning to set up a shot and using, you know, backdrop and lighting that all came from being at Henson. So I guess in a way it, it did kind of educate me. You know, I did learn something out of the internship aside from just, you know, having the amazing opportunities of fan to actually see hundreds of characters from all the different productions. And that I have to say was actually the neatest thing about it too, was that, you know, because we had to photograph so much stuff that had been storage for years, 
I mean, I saw stuff going back to the Ed Sullivan show to, you know, everything from the Dark Crystal to, you know, they had just finished the time when I was there, they would finish this wrapping filming on Muppets from Space and simultaneously um, Elmo and Grouchland. So they had characters coming back from the film sets to the workshop that had to be photographed and put into storage. So I was seeing new characters before people got to see them in those movies. And, um, you know, the cosmic fish that were in Muppets from Space and all the kind of things that were made for that movie and the different grouches from Elmo and Grouchland. And, um, you know, but it was just amazing. And going back to like, you know, the Christmas toy, I got to see Rugby Tiger in person and Mew Mouse and, you know, all, the, all those characters that like I was, you know, every day was like Christmas, back, speaking of the holidays, every day was like Christmas being there. I can imagine. Boxes, these boxes would come in from their storage facility and we'd have to go through them and photograph them. And it was like every day you were surprised at what the next thing was going to be from. And it was like, oh, my God, it's, you know, it's, it's you know, it's, it's rugby or it's, you know, it's it's Yorick from Ed Sullivan or, you know. And it was just it was just amazing, you know, to, as, as a fan, just to be part of it. And to also, I have to say, the people and the networking I made. Um, I'm still friends with a lot of the people who were workshop, you know, employees, some who had been hired by Jim himself, you know, had been there a long time. And it's nice because I still have this relationship with them on Facebook. And when I see them at events, it's always very nice to kind of catch up and say hello. You know, so the networking aspect of it and to and to work with these people who actually knew Jim, who, you know, worked alongside him you know, with his advisement is, is just was really neat as well. The people I'd read about in all my behind the scenes Muppet books over the years, you know, I got to work with some of these people. So that, you know, as a fan, again, was really, really humbling and amazing, you know, to be a part of. I'd like to go to one of these if possible. I, I think it would, it would be cool to kind of document it and highlight it on the podcast and just like meet like-minded fans like us. Well, not just fans, but people who, actually were in the thick of it yeah they, they, you definitely should i mean because they're always very different you know they do a nice job they're they're very intimate events because the theater at um museum moving image is not that big it seats maybe maybe several hundred i would say it's so so the they, you always have this very intimate feel i mean i've seen frank oz speak there he's done a couple of speaking engagements there and a lot of times they'll have um a signing they actually had an emmett otter one a few years back that i unfortunately had to miss uh, by the time i had gotten had heard about it the tickets were sold out they had paul williams there and he did like a cd signing for the soundtrack and they screened the movie and they showed like you know the outtakes and they had some of the other people who worked on the production there in person and i heard it was a really really nice event you know so they're always very well organized you know very fan friendly you know they have um, craig shaman does a great job he does like raffles he does giveaways and you know all this kind of stuff during the uh the screenings they have you know q and a's and it's it's really informative and it's fun. And then you, and because if you get the tickets for the events, you get admission, free admission to the exhibit is included. So if you haven't gone to the exhibit, you know, it's a great thing to take people to. I've been to the theater at the Museum of Moving Image once. This was back mm-hmm. in 2005. And it was for Marx Brothers retrospective. Oh, okay. And they showed the coconuts. And then right after that, they showed Duck Soup. Now... I'm a huge Marx Brothers fan. I own all the films, but I wanted the experience of seeing it in the theater. And I, I think they used the original reel because you saw wow. some kind of tears in the uh, in the celluloid of the 35 millimeter wow. film. But still, it, w- it was great to see it. I actually went with my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, and my future brother-in-law who had never experienced the Marx Brothers before. And now it's like we quote Groucho to each other all the time. So <laughs> I'm happy about that. I was so upset, though, in 2003, George Romero. Actually, I know I'm bringing him back into the conversation, but this 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 is one of the missed opportunities of my life that I regret to this day. He came and did a retrospective where they showed Night of the Living Dead, Dawn of the Dead, and Day mm-hmm. of the Dead, and a couple of his other films. And he was there that entire weekend ans- asking questions and um, missed it. Mm-hmm. But, uh, hey, you know, he's gone now. And I thought to myself, oh, I'll see him again when he comes back again. Yeah, no, I never I never met I never met George Romero. I'm not a huge zombie genre fan, but I do love the original Night of the Living Dead. I, I tried mm-hmm. the, the other ones. They're OK, okay but I, I love the I love the original. And my friend had met him at a uh, convention that unfortunately I couldn't attend. And I gave him my my DVD to have George Romero sign, and he got a really nice autograph on the Night of the Living Dead DVD for me. So I'm I'm very thankful to have that now, especially since he's passed on. You actually got George Romero's autograph. That is sick. 
Yeah, yeah. It was, and it personalized too, you know, because like some of these people, they won't personalize the autographs. You know, I'm not looking to sell it on eBay or something, you know. So I, sometimes the celebrities at these conventions, they don't want to just sign something because they know you're going to just turn it around the next day and stick it on eBay up for auction. Um, I always try to get them personalized if I can. And some people will only sign. And actually, yeah, they don't great, personalize it. If you want to actually hear a, a great Muppet related story about a convention guest that I met. Sure, oh, go yeah. ahead. <laughs> Are we allowed to curse on here? Let me start with that. You're allowed. Okay. I'm, I'm monetized, it, so you're allowed. So the so the story is not gonna you need it, it's you need it for this integrity of the story. Let me start there. So several years back, I had gone to Monster Mania convention in um, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, right outside the Philly area, um, and director John Landis was there, and he had a table and. Of course, John Landis has a long history with Jim Henson and Frank Oz. Frank Oz has turned up in many, almost all of John Landis's movies in some kind of cameo of some sort. Um, the Blues Brothers being one of them. The Blues Brothers, um, you know, uh, American Werewolf in London, you know. So I, we, we were talking about a million different things. And firstly, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. He took a lot of time with people. I talked to him for about 15 minutes and we got on the topic of Jim Henson and Frank Oz and John Landis who also, as you might or may not know, had a cameo in the film The Muppets Take Manhattan, which Frank Oz directed. I recall. Yes. And he, you know, as Leonard Weinsop, the Broadway producer, and uh, Kermit goes in the costume and tries to get him to sell, you know, buy his show, the script for his Broadway show. So John Landis tells the story to me <laughs> of when he went to, a just a, not, not, a, not a premiere or anything, just a regular local theater screening of Muppets Take Manhattan. He took his daughter at the time, who was maybe about five, six years old, and, you know, they watched the scene where he, you know, was on the screen with Kermit. And after Kermit walks out, his daughter turned to him and said, Daddy, you were mean to Kermit. And then all of a sudden, John Landis hears behind him, you <laughs> sucker. And it turns out the guy yelling, you <laughs> sucker at him was Cheech Marin, who was there with his son. <laughs> <watching> the <movie. laughs> oh, my God. That's a funny yeah. story. It was the best story that and I, you know, I've gone to a lot of these conventions over the years and met a lot of interesting people and some very big names. This has to be my favorite story that he's told that I've heard at, at, from one of these people at these conventions. I could just picture Cheech doing that. <laughs> That's the best part. Yeah, because and, and you know, again, it wasn't like at a, like a premiere where there's a bunch of celebrities. It was just, hey, I'm here with my kid. I'm here with my kid. And he just hears this, you know, that familiar voice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm really happy you took time out of your day to discuss your time with the Muppets and Emmett Otter and your favorite Muppet holiday related specials. It means a lot to me that you took time out of your day. I know that, you know, you have, you know, work that you have to get to in the morning. So uh, we're going to wrap it up right now. But it really means a lot to me that, you know, you, you took over the podcast. I know that we had discussed this back when we first started speaking to each other on Facebook. And you know, the reason why I brought you on now was because James Lilquist, who I do Rat Style Review with, we were talking about doing a Music is Live podcast episode about Emmett Otter. And I'm like, you know, I'm, I know there's someone else I want to bring on, Melissa Scopolitis. So <laughs> it means a lot to me that you're, you know, that we finally met face to face and then that, you know, everything that I said I wanted to talk with you about, we, we have. And it means a lot to me. Thank you so much. And, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I was very excited to ask. And, you know, again, I could talk about the Muppets as the day is long. So, and to just, you know, recap those experiences and, and, and go down that, that, you know, memory lane is, is really great. Cause I love to speak. It was a very happy time in my life. And, you know, there's, there's very few parts of, of my life that I think really stand out where I can say I was actually like genuinely happy was like the way everything was going. And that internship was definitely a time for me. And, um, I, you know, just to, to, to relive it was, was really great. And I really appreciate you having me on. And I love just talking to Muppet fans and, and networking with other people like-minded like myself. Definitely. Well, let's hope that you and I can go to a convention one day. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Awesome. Well, Melissa Scopolitis, thanks again for coming on the Music is Live podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a great Thanksgiving and thank you to your listeners. And thank you so much. Thank you. And happy Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas to you too as well. You too. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Bye. Thank you to my guest, Melissa Scopolitis, for joining me on this episode of Music is Live podcast. If you want to know more, check us out over at musicislivepodcast.com. 
Also check out our parent network, RodStyleReview.com. Look at some of the other podcasts that we have on that. 2022 is looking like it's going to be real promising for the show. Going to be having more guests. Going to be doing a lot of more different things, more remotes, more interviews, more reviews, more top 10 lists. The future's bright and endless, so I'm looking forward to it. And thank you for subscribing. Thank you for giving this show the time of day. You know, this is all done in my house. I don't have the budget of some of the bigger podcasts, but I got the heart. And it really means a lot to me that you even give it, give it the time of day. So thank you. And again, wishing all of you out there a safe and wonderful holiday season. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Saturday, and Happy Festivus. And above all, have a Happy New Year. And don't forget, all art is valid. See you around.